So on Wednesday night, um, during the meeting, I call it a meeting loosely, we ended up sat around tables chatting for the whole hour and a half, which was really great fun. Um, and one of the conversations that we had was actually about um, water. Now, um, we'd started by the whole, co I was telling them a little bit about what I wanted to speak about tonight. And, and David then mentioned, well, you know, you're aware that the same water that exists now is the same water that existed at the beginning because it basically it just does the same thing and it's on a continuous cycle all the time. So, you know, it, it's in the water, the heat makes it rise, turns into clouds, rains. Um, we drink it, we pee it, it then goes into the filtration system, ends up back in the water. You getting the idea? Yeah. Now, I can't remember the specific details, but it worked out that a certain amount of people in their lifetime would have ended up having that same water that someone else drunk in their body because it was all going through the same thing. Now, what are we made up of? The highest percentage is water. Now, do you not find it fascinating then that if we are all made up of the same water and there's a possibility that that water that you once drunk has been filtered and I have now drunk that as well, what does that mean? You're probably thinking, where is this going? And I've done it on purpose. It means more than you think. It means that actually we are more connected than we give, give each other credit. We are much more connected. Biology itself says that we're more connected just by that very pattern, yeah? Now, I've, I've, I've given that story to start deliberately because I want you from the very start of tonight to understand that we're aiming to try and figure out here how we can become more unified as a community. And that is my goal tonight, to start laying out some points of how we can ultimately get to this place where we feel so at one with each other that we can truly have a massive impact on not just the city but the whole world because I think it's quite incredible. Now I believe the single most destructive lie that exists on our planet is this. Can I have the first slide please? The lie of separation. I believe it is the most destructive lie that exists in our universe. Now what we fail to realize sometimes is that the majority of things that we believe now in 2015 are a result of generation after generation after generation after generation and their beliefs that have been continually passed down. And there's been maybe minor changes and major, major uh, minor ad ad adaptions, but overall, how we live is very much based on a belief from what has been. Now, if we go way back, then that would ultimately take us right back to God. God, this um, divine being in the sky, whatever you want to call it, that that was the start of time. So we could say, therefore, that whatever the belief then was about the divine and about God will ultimately have a knock-on effect to then how we live our lives today. You only have to look at our political system, right? and our legal system, the majority of reasons we have the legal system that we have is because of the very legal structure that the Bible presents. The moral code that you read in scripture, the way that the law works just in your day-to-day -day life is actually very much based on those similar sorts of concepts. The law didn't just somehow suddenly appear oh, okay, we'll now design a court and we'll make a law. No, law exists because of generations of beliefs, which ultimately goes back to what? The start of time and the original beliefs of what law should be. And therefore, here we have now in 2015, the results of those things. Now, the greatest lie of all, and I could have really labeled this under a toxic whispers message, but I've decided not to. Um, we believe, and this is very important, we believe that God resided in Eden. And therefore, when we chose to eat the wrong fruit, we were ultimately banished from Eden, which in turn meant we were banished from God. Did you get that? So, we believe that God was in Eden, that that's where he resided, that that was almost like a heavenly, heavenly place. So when we chose to eat of the wrong fruit, and when then he banished man, 
we read that, that therefore that we were excommunicated and that we were no longer in relationship with God. We had been pushed out of where God was. Now, right there is the greatest lie of all. And in 2015, we are still seeing and paying the price of that belief. And I'm going to explain a little bit more as we go. You see, the sin Adam committed was so bad, so bad. I mean, taking that through was so bad that the relationship between man and God was totally severed. And until a person then professes to have faith in Jesus Christ, they will remain separate from God, both now and in the afterlife. Now, we've come a long way, because when you hear that now, it sounds a bit, a bit wrong, doesn't it? The fact that somehow the mistake of man in the garden would cause such a problem to God that then he would completely alienate himself from man until he could see his son die, and therefore somehow things would then be okay again. Now, did Jesus die? Yes, he did. And we've understood that there was a whole list of things that were going on with that, much more amazing than we've ever realized. But are you seeing where I'm going with this? Now, if that's actually true, that God would be like that, to me, that actually speaks quite negatively of God's character. That if he can be someone who excommunicates somebody because of one choice to make a mistake and make a bit of a stupid decision, then that actually makes him actually more unkind than a lot of my, my friends or people that I, I live my life around. Do you understand what I mean? So we've got to look at this from a very different angle. Now what's interesting, we say that God's all-knowing as well, but if then God was all-knowing, and then when Adam then made the mistake, why, why was there so much of a of a shock. So these are questions that are, are good to ask. Like Jenny said, sometimes these questions are really good to present. Here's another one. The lamb that was chosen before the foundation of the earth, we're allowed to quote that now, but back then, God, it, God didn't need to use that because God was mad. But the fact is, remember, if the lamb was chosen before the foundation of the earth, that was way before Adam was made which therefore means that when Adam took of the tree, that same lamb had still been chosen as a sacrifice. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we've got to look at this in a completely different way. Now, what's very interesting, you only need to read into the next chapter, right, of Scripture after what we call the fall, right? And we see a story about two brothers, Cain and Abel, and we realize that God is still making just as much conversation with them as he was with Adam and Eve. Now, this is an interesting question because if the sin of man had caused God to pull away and to no longer be in fellowship with him, why then was God making conversation with Cain and Abel? Because from then on, there's, everything's still about God's communication with man. The, the whole of Scripture is, is based on God and his dealings with man. And yet somehow we still have this belief, but God is separate from us. And this is where the problem is. For example, Cain murders his brother Abel, but then puts a mark on him so he will be safe. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? If sin was such a problem to him... Why would he have put a mark on Cain to protect him? Now, do we agree that we make stupid decisions? Was it stupid that Cain should kill his brother? We understand that he killed his brother because of the whole issue of fairness. Yes, it was stupid. But it clearly didn't affect God as such that he could still not love, care, and, and be at one with his people. So, I want to throw this in as well here. Did you know that there is not one scripture in the Bible, not one, that talks about sin separating all men from God? Not one. There are scriptures that talk about sin separating because of particular choices that have been made in, in um, what's the word called, when you, in a particular context because of choices, but nothing that says a blanket statement about man being disconnected from God. Here's another one. None of the 600 plus laws talk anything about hell or being separated from God. 
not one. The worst that can happen to you is death. That's, that's you die, which is gonna happen to us all anyway, right? But there's, there's nothing about hell and there's nothing about separation from God. So do you see what's happening here? That actually what we've based our understanding of God on has produced a whole issue for ourselves, and yet when you actually look at it carefully, it's not actually happening and it's not there, which is why I want to dissect this a little bit and really free us to see what the truth is about it. Are you all with me? You're all very quiet. Just about, that's good. (laughs) Now, the other issue we have here is we have a bit of a contradiction. Do you hear terms like, God is the Alpha and Omega, the I am, the all in all, but then at the same time, we're told that we're separate. You can see why people get stressed. It's like, well, is it the all in all and is it the alpha and omega or are we separate? Like, like which one is it? Practical examples. We tell people, let's use worship to bring in the presence of the Lord. Or we pray to invite God into our situation. Yeah? Or we Ask God to become a part of our lives. All things that are the common narrative of the church, we say, you ask and invite, and then he comes, hopefully, if everything's just right. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. Now, do you have to welcome gravity into your life for it to keep you attached to earth? Wow. (laughs) Thank you. Ah, get some caffeine given out, cups of coffee, that should help. (laughs) Did gravity exist before we realized it was there? So when we realized that gravity, when someone figured out the scientific formula for gravity, that didn't make it, that didn't make it happen. Gravity was always there. It just happened that we then had a formula to say that it was there. See, to me, God is exactly the same. We might find formulas that understand God better, but it never ever changes where God has been all along. And some of you need to realize that tonight. Even everything we say on this platform, we might be giving you new things to think about, but the fact is it has absolutely no impact whatsoever on where God is in our world and in our universe, not one. It might free us to be more aware of it and and get into a greater consciousness about it, But God has always been, and I want you tonight, if you take one thing away from tonight, I want it to be that you understand that God has always been connected to you, and he has always been a part of you, and none of the stupid decisions that you have ever made will ever affect that. We could really just leave it there, couldn't we, and just go and have fun do. Yeah. (laughs) Right, now, question. Would having a different view of God make the world different? If what we've understood about God, we now realize is why we're in the place we are today. If the original concept of God had have been different right from the start, would our world look different now? Likely, yes. I agree. Capital, yes. Would it affect our experience here on earth? Yes, it would. It would change the way we lived, the way we view ourselves, and the way we view others. It would flip the behavior of humanity completely on its head, I believe. If we all accepted our oneness with God or something divine, when I say divine, by the way, I'm talking about something greater than, something bigger than, a spirit, we call it God. We would see everyone around us as also being at one with that same source. And this is where I get really excited. Therefore, anything we do to another, we also do to ourselves and God. Is this making sense? Crunch point here. It says in the Bible, so much as you have done it unto the least of these, you have also done it unto me. If this was our perspective, we would never be motivated to do anything destructive towards anyone else simply because if everyone treats the other person as if they were God, all those behaviors would cease to be. Wow. Wow. I think it's absolutely immense. By the way, I don't quite live by this yet. 
So I don't want you to hear me say it and think, oh, well, that sounds quite hard. Like, I'm going to have to ask Joel at the end how he does it. I don't a lot of the time, which is precisely why I'm bringing it. <laughs> it's true, you know, actually, the best things to speak about are actually sometimes the things that you haven't grasped. Because as you're saying it, you're aware, oh, this is something that I really want to get. I don't believe we're at that place as a house, and I don't believe that the world is at that place, which is why I believe it has to start somewhere. And if it's true that we are running the race marked out for us unconventional by design, I believe that it can start here. It can start here, and it can start here tonight. And I really want that to be the call. I want like a call to action that we really get on board tonight and really get inspired to pursue this. Now, most people adopt and live by the following belief. I'm just going to run through these quickly. Next slide. It's called separation theology. We are over here and God is over there. Okay? Separation theology moves on to this. Separation cosmology, which says this. Everything is separate from everything else. Next one. Which leads to separation psychology. This place is me over here and you over there, which leads to separation sociology. We encourage individuals to act as separate entities, each serving their own interests, which leads to separation pathology, which is we behave in a self-destructive way, causing suffering, conflict, and violence. Do you see how a separation theology about how we view God, if you've seen where it ends up? Pathology, by the way, is just like a typical, typical type, it becomes the norm. Now that's quite scary that something at the beginning can end up being a widespread, almost like a disease, which is why unless we fix the root at the beginning, we can never see a change in what's happened along the line. You see, the taking of the tree of knowledge and good and evil brought about what we call self-awareness. An ability to measure all things against themselves rather than viewing everything as being connected to the tree of life. Everything being connected to one source. This is what happened. God became the something other rather than the essence to which all life was connected to. So God becomes it. God was it. God starts as it. But then he becomes something else. Something outside of ourselves. Something to be grasped. Something to be attained. Something to be held on to. Whereas before, there was never any difference. Right? Now, when a baby's born, it was interesting because Jenny told me this, when a baby's born, within the first year of its life, um, it believes that it's, it's its mother. It believes it is still it's an expression of its mother. It's the same expression. And after that point, they call it separation anxiety, apparently. I didn't actually research it, but apparently what happens is as they begin to realize that they are doing things for themselves, they actually become very afraid because they realize that like, I'm on my own. I'm actually not, I'm not part of my mother anymore. When actually the truth is the baby is always part of the mother because it's, the DNA is still within that child and nothing has ever changed. But in its head, it says, I am no longer my mother anymore. I am my own entity. I am here Mother is over there. So everything becomes individual. Everything, everything becomes something to be disconnected. And therefore, what happens? We become anxious. We become afraid. And then choices like this start to happen. We start to become violent. We have conflicts. All of those things because of a, an original fear that we're no longer connected to the source. Now, whilst the self has insisted that everything is separate, nothing has ever, ever changed. Nothing. We are still at one. Now listen to what Jesus says about this in John 17 in the King James. I'm using the King James again. See if I can read it. It says this, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Listen to this. 
that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and thou hast loved me. Forgive the old language, but that to me was the best version. It's all about being at one. Can you see that? He's saying, Father, let them realize that they live the same existence on this earth as what I experience. They just don't know it yet. Let them know. Let something wake them up to realize that they are just at one with the Father as I am. It's just so exciting. Look at this. Malachi 2.10. Have we all not one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? Amazing. Romans 15 verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Can you see where I'm going with this? It's all about unity. We have believed the lie of separation. Some of us will say we haven't. All of us have to some degree. And you can tell by our, often by our outworkings with those around us. And it doesn't necessarily have to be severely negative. I'm not talking about you know, brawls and whatever. I'm talking about just our general fear of life and interactions with people comes from a belief that somehow they are another and I am another, rather than actually seeing that everything you're doing to another person is part of who you are. And it's just, I think it's really incredible. Just because we are all connected to this one thing does not mean that we all look and act the same. So I don't want you to go out of here tonight believing that we're going to be cloned, that everyone should be like saying the same things, doing the same things, loving the same songs, whatever. We're not looking for a cloned group of people, right? Differences do not mean separation. Like what Chris spoke about the other week about the different bird. Differences do not mean separation. Let's look at the ocean for a second. There are thousands of different fish in the ocean, but nevertheless, they're all still part of the same ocean. A wave in the middle of the ocean is a different expression, but it doesn't have to find its way back to the ocean. It's still part of the ocean. And let me put it this way, I'm just gonna put it very bluntly. You are a part of God's body. You are a part of God's body, which is the whole universe. And therefore, get this, you do not need to find your way back to it because you are already it. <gasps> You're allowed to get excited. This is freeing stuff. This is freeing stuff. You do not need to find your way back to it because you are already it. Now that's some good news right there. Well, I think it's good news anyway. See, the lie of separation, Eden, created a legal system which would uphold this belief. Now you don't need to, we've, we've talked about this loads, about the whole thing of how because of the law, it created exclusion and judgment and condemnation, whereas the whole point of life was supposed to be about love and inclusion, yeah? Now, do you know this, that where there is unity, there is no need for law. No need for law at all. Oneness, get rid of law. Do you know why? Because if we're truly one, you can't damage the other person, can you? Because if you damage the other person, who are you damaging? Yourself. Therefore, we wouldn't do that anymore because we're aware, actually, to harm that person, I harm me. And hang on a second. If we are also one with the Father, I harm that person. I not only harm me, but I also harm God. And God is everything, the all in all, the universe. So does that therefore mean I'm also harming the universe? No, that's wrong. Let's not do that. You would never, ever want to make a negative choice towards another person, ever. And if there's no negative choices towards one another, the law is obsolete. 
Because law is only needed to police people who can't get on with one another. Is that not right? Brilliant. So I'm just saying it to myself. Brilliant. Yeah. So Jesus comes along and he has his work cut out. He saw just how separation theology, this whole business of getting God wrong, had completely screwed up the world. Read the New Testament and watch what's going on. It's pretty horrible what Jesus enters into because people are so confused and so stressed out about what really everything is about, right? So he sets out on his mission, get this, not to change behaviors that was not his job. He was not into sin management, right? He wanted to undo the lie that had swept through the earth. He wanted to change the hearts of the people. It says, I will write my law on their heart. Which law? The law of love. What is love? God. Therefore, he was going to write the very nature of God within each person. Absolutely incredible. Now, the religious hated this. Hated it. Because he seemed to be just as at one with the prostitutes, the murderers, the adulterers, the drug addicts, etc., 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 as those who thought they ticked all the boxes. He was just as at one. Why was he at one with them then? Why? Because the, the good and bad were never a criteria to him. It was of no interest to him whatsoever. You see, he accepted all life as an ongoing expression of himself in spite of the stupid decisions that had been made, right? But he knew that if he could change the belief of mankind, then just possibly everything would start to look different. I think that's awesome. So listen, to all of you here tonight, all of the dis silly decisions that we might have made, God's not looking at that. He's looking inside of you and saying, are you going to remember? Are you going to remember who you are? Are you going to remember the law that I've written on your heart and remember how significant you are in the grand scheme of things? Like you are massively important. And that's what I love about the heart of Jesus when I read, you know, the Gospels. He's never trying to, ch to change what someone's done you know, like when people are caught, he's not like, you know, well, we need to fix that now because you could have shamed the church, this, that, and the other. It's never about that. It's all about, you know, take my hand. Like, like you're a reflection of me. And they look into his eyes and say, oh, how can someone like me be a reflection of you? And it's because he doesn't see the stuff. He sees himself. Now, isn't that awesome? So when God looks at you, he doesn't see the rubbish. He sees himself. Now, how much better would it be if when we start looking at people, we don't see the rubbish, but we see God in it? Wouldn't it be better? Now, that doesn't mean that the rubbish doesn't mean that then there are certain consequences in life and that certain things have to happen to bring about change. I get that. But when we're talking about the way that we are towards people. So if I go and make a stupid choice now and it lands me getting arrested, right? It doesn't mean that you don't love me anymore. It means that I have to face a certain amount of things, but it doesn't mean that the heart towards me has changed because who's seen? God. Is this making sense? Now, it might be too much for some of you, but I'm wanting to show you the expanse of how amazing God actually is. And I think we've made it way too small, and I just think it's totally phenomenal. So, the Pharisees wanted to maintain separation. But Jesus came to reveal that it had never existed, never. See, Jesus doing good deeds for people was okay. The Pharisees weren't bothered about him healing people and, you know, whatever, helping people. But then when he started talking about him being at one with the Father, whoa, that really did throw a spanner in the works. Because here we have a man somehow claiming to be at one with God, an absolute no-no. It was a no-no. And ultimately, and I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, that was what had Jesus killed. That's what had Jesus killed. 
because his oneness with the Father was too much for people to handle. They couldn't bear it. Because what does it do? Oneness with the Father brings unity and includes people we don't like. Doesn't it? <gasps> but I'm not like them. I'm not like them. That's inclusion for you. That's what inclusion looks like. Now, I, want, I really want that badly. I want it. I want it for myself. I want it for this house. And I, think, I do think we're taking steps to get there. And that's what's really exciting me. That even though sometimes we might not get it right, that I believe at heart, this is where we're heading. And I think if we can just get a grip of who we are in the eyes of God, I think we can completely change things around. I think it's so exciting. So, Jesus knew that the enemy of his kingdom was anything that convinced you are another outside of what God says you are, that you were separate. Anything that tells people that they're separate is the enemy of the kingdom. It's the enemy. Whatever you've done, whatever choice you've made, you are not separate. And anybody who tells you you are separate, that is the enemy of the peaceable kingdom of God. So, hands up in here, we have all been that enemy, most likely, at some point in our lives. Yeah, we've likely struggled to include, struggled to see past, struggled to see the God in a situation, and therefore excluded, not necessarily deliberately, but because of our own unconsciousness about ourselves. But it's happened, hasn't it? So, when we talk about the devil... Um, whatever that means. It's a, another preach. Um, I would like to believe that the devil, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, whatever, the whole heart behind that word is anybody who tries to take away unity. Look at Lucifer right at the beginning, the serpent. What did he try and do? Tried to say, you can be your own entity you do not be, need to be plugged into this life source anymore. That's what he said. Now, we can all do that same thing. We can tell people that actually, you can do it for yourself. You can be your own entity. That's what this life's about. Like that video, it's about wealth, fame, fortune, whatever. Find it for yourself. Be disconnected. That's the best way to be because then you can't what? Get hurt. That's what we teach, isn't it? The more individual you are, the safer you'll be. When actually, I'd like to believe the more at one we are, the safer we will be. Really would. For God to separate from humanity, he would have to be separate from himself. And he can't do that because he is the Alpha and Omega, the all in all. So we blow that one straight out of the water. Right? No choice. Not one. Not one choice. And I'm not one, right, can ever, ever, ever separate you from God. Not one. That will be hard for, for some of you to stomach. Not one. When you make the choice, he doesn't leave you and you don't have to ask him to come back into your heart. Not one. He is in it. He's with you. He's experiencing everything you feel, everything you think, everything you do. But guess what? He is still there. Tapping at your heart saying, will you remember? Will you remember? That's what he's saying. And if you don't, you don't. We face our own struggles of our own inability to remember the beauty of it all. But it's still there. Just incredible. Look at this. Romans 8 verse 35. If you could put that one up, please. Is this making sense? I hope it is. I know I get excited, but it's really stirring me and I think it's fantastic. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? It's a question we always ask. If I get myself into a boo-boo, does that mean that God no longer loves me? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Can I have the next one, please? Where are we? There we go. As the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death 
nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Boom. I'd like the Bible just to be that. Open up, you read that, you close, the end. Would have probably done us quite a lot of good, actually, if there was... <laughs> I love the Bible. I think it's fascinating. It can never be figured out, and I don't think it's supposed to be figured out. It's supposed to be a whole crazy network of different stuff that inspires and teachers and whatever, but I sometimes think because of the fact that it doesn't really resol like resolve itself, the amount of questions leaves so many gaps sometimes that then if you were to just read that in all of it and say, but nothing can separate, and the whole thing is divine, and actually with all the stuff that's going on, I know deep in my heart that actually God will never separate himself from me. And that is where freedom comes. Last scripture, I'm nearly done. Hebrews 2, 11 to 12. <clears throat> that, yeah. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same, <clears throat> the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly, I will sing your praises. Who's singing your praises? Not the other way around. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Look who's singing your praises. I never saw this one before. By the way, I've read the Bible numerous times, and that's the first time I've ever seen that scripture, I'd just like to add. I think someone put it there recently. I'm actually not kidding. I think it's been added. Yes. Because, you see, when I say I read the Bible, I read it, like, online or on a tablet. I'm, I don't have the... Um, so I believe that people just sort of add things in as they go along, just sort of, oh, this one sounds pretty good today. But seriously, I've never seen it before. And when I read it, I thought, oh, he sings my praises? Wow. That's pretty awesome. Nearly finished. You can trace your lineage to the same father as Jesus and share exactly the same DNA. What he is, is what you are. So if God himself can call us his brethren, can we also do that the same for ours? If God can sing your praises, can we sing the praises of another? Anyway, wrapping up. In all of this, like I said earlier, we have to figure out what love looks like sometimes. So we might be in positions where you have to turn over tables. You have to say, get behind me. You might take someone out for dinner. You might buy someone a gift. You might rebuke someone. You might hug someone. Don't ever think love looks one way because it really doesn't at all. You only need to look at Jesus' life and realize that love did not look the same in every situation he was in. I mean, at one point it says, get behind me, Satan. Now, if we say that that was Jesus not being very loving, then we've got a problem there because he was an incarnation of God and God is love. So therefore, nothing he said or did ever detached itself from that love. So therefore, a statement like that must have just been an act of love and was just right for that time. Yeah? So don't ever box off how some of these things should look like in the way that we act with one another. There are times when I'm challenged. It doesn't mean that we're not at one. It just means that I'm being told something that actually is going to benefit me and my life. So, embracing the truth that God and we are one changes everything. This is the true meaning, I believe, of being a human being and not a human doing. Why? Because if God is in us and God is love, then love is what we express. We be love. There is nothing really to do anymore in our interactions with people. 
in essence, if we just are, then we will be love once we've awakened to the fact that God is within us. From the beginning of time, fellowship and unity was at the heart of creation, to love and be loved. Now let me throw out this. Life is not what you think it is. It's something far better. The God you thought was someone other doesn't even come close to the true God of the universe. We're living at a smidgen of what is possible. This is the decision we are being invited to make. And I'm going to throw out this invitation. You'll have picked up on certain bits tonight that you like and certain things that you just thought he has absolutely lost the plot entirely. It's fine, right? My job is to speak my heart. This is where I'm at. Like you say, you might think I'm a lunatic, right? But if you get one point, that's great. That's great. I always say when I'm teaching my lessons in the back, if you get one thing from today's lesson, I've done okay because at least you're able to take that away. And I think that's important. You might remember one word that I've said tonight that gives you a fresh approach to all of this. So here's the invitation. And I'm not going to give you a way to do it. It's actually a challenge to yourself. Are we ready to change our mind about God and in the process make a decision about ourselves and who we really are? Are we willing to change our mind about God and in changing our mind about God, make a decision to now realize that who we are is something very different to what we thought we were? Changing our mind about God can bring more peace, more joy, more love, more unity, more companionship, not just for a moment, but for a complete lifetime. And that there is the end.